Anyway, um, we're in 1 Corinthians 10, so what I'm going to do is, because if you're like me, I was like, how in the world did we get to 1 Corinthians 10? I mean, we've been going through, but we're picking up kind of in the middle of a section, so I think we're going to need to reorient ourselves to figure out why Paul is saying to the Corinthians what he's saying in chapter 10. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read the first five verses of of, uh, chapter 10, then I'm going to pray, and then I'll give a little broader (laughs) introduction to get us back in lockstep with Paul and with what's happened in 1 Corinthians so that we can then press on and we'll make some New Year's connections. Uh, This is a very appropriate I feel, uh, albeit difficult, uh, appropriate New Year's message for today. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1, begins with the word moreover. And Paul says, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Well, that gives us an interesting start off to this chapter, doesn't it? Let's pray. Lord, as we think about uh, the year past, uh, the year coming up, the days coming up, Lord, we, uh, as we get into your word, we are thankful that, uh, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. You were the same 2,000 years ago. You're the same 4,000 years ago. You're the same in 2018 and the same in 2019. So, Lord, you give stability to our lives, that in a changing world, in changing times, in changing cultures, changing societies, changing empires, that you are unchanging. So, Lord, I pray that you uh, help us to hear, Lord, by your Spirit, what you want us to hear today. Glean what we need to glean. Take away what we need to take away so we can serve you better. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. All God's people said, amen. Well, just before chapter 10, at the end of chapter 9, Paul talked about Christians' uh, as if they were running a race. He said, you know, verse 24, don't you know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? He says, run in such a way that you win. And then he goes on to talk about being disqualified in verse 27. He says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest what I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And I draw your attention to that because it's that idea of being disqualified. It's the idea of discipline and disqualification that Paul's going to pick up on in chapter 10, and it's going to take the Corinthians and you and I for a walk down memory lane. But before I get there, if you're in a race and you want to win, you can either train hard, be disciplined, or you can get in the race and you can trip other people up that are running with you. That will usually get you disqualified. Now, the challenge that that started back in chapter 8 was the Corinthians really wanting to be able to exercise their freedom to eat meat that had been sacrificed to idols. In Corinth, there were plenty of temples to false gods, and those temples were connected to um, meals, sacrificial meals, and you could buy meat there. And the Corinthians, because of their knowledge and understanding that there's no such thing as false gods, we're with them in that, right? We know there's, no, there's only one God. Can we, can we say amen to that church? There's only one God. So we know that there's no such thing as these other gods. So the Corinthians said, well, you know, then we should have no problem. We should be able to eat meat sacrificed to the idols. And so in a sense, they're right, but Paul says there's some other people in your congregation that have come from worshiping those idols, and if they see you eating in an idol's temple, it's going to freak them out. Like, they, they don't have the freedom to do that like you might. So Paul gives them a whole chapter on what it looks like to actually love people by being willing to give up your freedom if you're using your freedom, will cause them to be tripped up or stumbled. That's why he uses that idea of a race. If you're running a race, Christian, if you're running a race, Corinthian, and in that race you are tripping other people by using your freedom, then guess what? You get disqualified. And so 
Love is an essential part of grace. I mean, if, you're, if we're going to live under grace, we also have to realize that love is an essential part of that. Now, uh, we'll go on this wonderful walk down memory lane as they argue for this right and argue for their freedoms. Paul argues for love. And they're going to argue that they should be able to do this and they should be able to do that and, and they should have these freedoms. And, and that's why Paul takes them here in, in chapter 10 through some of this extensive history. There's a lot of history in this chapter, so because I want to get to the main point of what Paul's trying to say, I won't outline the stories in detail. I would highly suggest you take some time, if you haven't done it already, and read your Old Testament. I know some people go, well, the Old Testament's the Old Testament. What does it have to say to us? Paul actually says it has a lot to say to us because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The way God was with the, with the Israelites while they wandered in the wilderness is the way God will be even today. Otherwise, what Paul says would be useless, right? I mean, what, could the, what could we possibly learn from the Israelites? In the, that was the Old Testament, and we live in the New Testament times. Well, Paul says it doesn't matter. It's the same God. Now, we sit here on the edge of 2019. We're just finishing up 2018, and some of you may know that the month January is named after the God, the mythological God, Janus. Do you know Janus? Not, J -A -A, not J A N I C E, the girl's name, J A N U S, Janus. It was a two faced God. Janus had two heads, or two faces, literally, one faced backward and one face forward. So Janus is the two faced God, and always a face looking back, a face looking forward. And that's kind of what we do at the new year. We have one face looking back at the year in review, the year path. What happened in 2018? How was 2018 for you? Was it a good year for you? Anybody say 2018 was a great year? How many, for 20, uh, how many of you, uh, 2018 was a hard year, a tough year? Yeah, a little bit of both maybe. Okay, so we look back, we go, okay. We're also looking ahead going, what, what comes next for, what does 2019 hold for us? A lot of potential, a lot of possibility. And so Paul in chapter 10 makes the Corinthians do the same thing. He makes them look back at the past, the distant past, so that they can look into their future. How many of you know of... Um, Elevation Church down in North Carolina. A really hugely popular, vastly growing church. They have a very popular worship team that has made a lot of songs. And do you know the song, Do It Again? Uh, did Josh, did we sing that? I don't think we sang that this morning. They have a song called Do It Again. And it's a really neat song. I happen to like the song. But in the song, it outlines and mentions a lot of these things from the Old Testament. In the song, it mentions the walls of Jericho falling down. In the song, it mentions the parting of the Red Sea. And he says, you know, We've seen you move, Lord. You can move mountains. We want to see you do it again. And that's the kind of songs we like. We've seen God do these miracles, part the sea, move mountains, and God, we want to see you do it again. Well, the song that Paul is going to sing to the Corinthians is a much different kind of song. He's going to sing about things that he saw God do in the past, not mountain moving and Red Sea crossing, although he will mention those things. He's going to mention plagues and death and a generation that died in the wilderness. Now, that's not the kind of song you usually say, hey, God, we watched you give plagues to your people in the past, and we, we want to see you do it again, Lord. This is not a top-selling worship song for congregational use. This is not what we usually do. But I think as parents, we understand that there's a place for warning in lives, right? As parents, we warn our kids. We, we, there's a place for warning, and sometimes we as a church, uh, the church in general, in our culture, we tend to shy away from warnings. We don't want to make people feel uncomfortable or upset. So we're all about encouragement, and that's good. But Paul says, for the Corinthians, because of their, listen carefully, because of their pride, they need a really stiff warning. And so, uh, you know, uh, don't shoot the messenger. I'm just laying it out as Paul lays it out for the Corinthians. But maybe, just maybe, there's one or two or more people here this morning that really... Uh, are wrestling with or struggling with or dealing with pride. And that may be exposed this morning. And a warning may be exactly what you need to get back on track in this new year. So are you with me, church? All right. So Paul begins uh, talking about disqualification. He says, okay, this reminds me of the Old Testament. He says, moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was 
Christ. So the walk down memory lane, the events of the Exodus, and the time following the Exodus from uh, after they came out of Egypt to they went uh, in, into the promised land. Interestingly, this Passover, remember they came out of Egypt, the plagues, the Passover, do you remember that? Say yes if you remember that. Yeah, that was their new year. God said at the Passover, he said this month, the month that they celebrate the Passover, which is not January, but it's more like April, that this is gonna be the beginning of months for you. So the Jews have two calendars, a civil calendar and a religious calendar. The Passover began a new year for them, the beginning of their religious calendar. But, but what jumps out at you as you read those four verses there, is there a word that seems to jump out to you? How about the word all? It's easy to overlook, right? But don't you see the emphasis on that word? All did this, all did that, all did this, all did that. So Paul's showing them that these Jews, the Israelites, the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, they shared some common experiences with the grace of God. Uh, the first one is they were all under the cloud. Uh, what does that mean? Well, they come out of Egypt, which is great, coming out of bondage, out of slavery. 400 years, they were subjects in, uh, and lived a hard, hard life in, uh, of oppression in Egypt. And then God brings them out, but that's great. Like, where do we go? I mean, once we've, now we're out of Egypt. We're leaving the lives we've had for generations, and, and we're facing this wilderness. Where do we go? Well, God said, I got you covered. Literally, I got you covered. I'm gonna cover the area with a cloud and lead you by this cloud. Exodus 13, 21 says, the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to go by day and night. They could travel during the day because the cloud would keep them cool, would cover them from the rays of the sun. It's a natural sunscreen, I guess you could say. And then they had, night, they had a nightlight. God gave them a nightlight, and they would be able to travel by night if need be. And when the cloud stopped, they would stop. And when the cloud went, they'd go, oh, look, the cloud's moving. Let's get, and they would go. And they had God's guidance and presence and direction. They all passed through the sea. Even if you don't know the Bible, even if you've never read the Bible, you know about the Red Sea crossing, correct? That's what he's referring to. They all passed through the sea. What sea? The Red Sea after Egypt coming out. Remember, God leads them out. The, the uh, Egyptians can't wait to get rid of them because a firstborn in every house had died. And they said, we got to get rid of these Israelites. They're causing us a lot of trouble. So they send them out with gold and, and presents and all that stuff. Get out, get out of here. And they go and they come to the Red Sea. Well, Pharaoh changes his mind, begins to chase them down, says, hey, I want to get these slaves back. There goes, you know, three million slaves we've just let loose, and he goes to get them. So the Israelites are stuck. In front of them is the Red Sea, and behind them is the Egyptian army. I mean, they are stuck, and they start to freak out, naturally speaking. And they cry out to Moses, and Moses cries out to God, and, and Moses says these fairly famous words. He says, do not be afraid. He says this to the people. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which he will accomplish for you today. And then God made a way. He parted the Red Sea. Miraculously, the walls of water stood up on each side and every single Israelite walked across on dry ground. And then God closed the waters back down on top of the Egyptian army. So God fought for them and God rescued them. They all, every, is there any Israelite that got stuck with the Egyptian army as the waters came back? No, they all made it through the sea. Paul says, then they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. What does Paul mean by baptized into Moses? Well, it's a figure of speech. The word baptism just means to be immersed into. And when they were under the cloud and when they were in the water, again, they weren't literally in the water, but they were between the walls of water, uh, they were there because of what God was doing through Moses. So was, in a sense, they were following Moses leadership as Moses was following God's leadership. They were identified with Moses. Does that make sense? And, and in that sense, they were baptized, immersed into Moses' leadership. But the important thing Paul wants you to know and wants the Corinthians is to know is that they had a baptismal experience that applied to all of them. That's what he's saying here. They were all baptized into Moses, and not only did they have a 
baptismal experience. They also had a communion experience. They shared a common bread together, right? They all ate the same spiritual food. What do you, what do you think that food is? Come on, you don't even have to know the Bible to know this one. Manna, right, <laughs> manna. By the way, do you know what the, the literal translation into English of manna is? Spam. No, it's not spam. <laughs> I, I was in the pantry the other day. The kids here love to get snacks from the pantry, so I went in there, and I saw these cans of spam in the pantry in the church, and I just thought, what is that? What is spam? And, but that's what manna means. Manna means, what is it? And so the Israelites, they come out of Egypt, now they're nomadic people, they're wandering in the wilderness, God provides for them food, quail in the evening and manna in the morning. They had manna for breakfast, they'd wake up in the morning, the Bible says, the dew lay all around the camp, and when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance as fine as frost on the ground. And then they'd, they'd go out and they'd collect up this manna, and it, which literally means, what is it? They'd collect it up, and by the end of the day, everybody had all of their needs met. They all had the same spiritual food. Just like we all, when we come to communion, the idea is that we all break bread together. We all share the same bread, the body of Christ. And with that comes not just the food part, the bread part, but the drink part. All drank the same spiritual drink. They all shared a common cup, you could say. It wasn't a cup, it was a rock, actually, they, the same spiritual drink, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, that was Christ. What drink did they drink? Well, twice during their wanderings, it's recorded water from a rock. Do you remember, not a rack, a rock. It was sort of a rack, it was a rackish in the area. But they would, uh, when they came out of Egypt, they, they needed water to drink. I mean, you're wandering in the wilderness, you need water to survive. And so God told Moses, hey, strike the rock. This is Exodus 17. People were thirsty, they complained. God tells Moses to strike the rock, and what happened? He hits the rock, and water comes out. Takes care of the, the thirst, satisfies the thirst of the entire nation. Now, there's one other place. That's at the beginning of their journey. At the end of their journey, Numbers chapter 20, we see another story where the people are complaining because they don't have water. They're thirsty. They're saying to God, why'd you bring us out here to die? You should just left us in Egypt. We were better off there. Wah, wah, wah. And God tells uh, Moses to, okay, you know, Moses is saying, God, look, the people are complaining again. They want water. And God says, okay, Moses, take your rod. And Moses is like, I know where this is going. I've done this before. And it's almost like he doesn't hear anything that God says after that. But God says, take your rod and then go speak to the rock. So there's a rock in Exodus 17, a rock in Numbers chapter 20. The first time God is tells Moses to strike it. The second time, he tells him to speak to it. But what does Moses do? Moses is angry at the people. God's not angry at the people, but Moses is angry. So Moses, in his anger, strikes the rock twice. And God, in his grace, still gives the people water. But there's a price for Moses to pay. He's not going to go into the promised land. So that rock is there on both sides of their journey. And both times, Paul call, calls it by the same name. So the Jews had a, a uh, sort of a history where they believed that this rock followed them, that there was a well of water that traveled miraculously with the Israelites as they traveled through the wilderness. And every time they stopped for a drink, there was a, a well there. And Paul says that rock, that spiritual rock that they drank from, that was Christ. Now, the interesting thing to note is that, that, that what Paul says is that rock followed them. Have you ever thought about that? Like the idea that they have is that there's this rock, a, a rolling stone, you could say, this rock that as they're traveling through the wilderness, that they'd stop and they'd look back and then the rock would stop. And then they'd walk some more and they'd stop and then the rock would stop. And, and that's not the picture that, that you should be having. But the idea is that Christ, the living water, was with them the whole time they were in the wilderness, satisfying their thirst. See, Jesus says about himself that he's not only the bread that comes down from heaven, but he's also a well of living water. I love that, that he who drinks of this water, you know, will never thirst again. Do you know that satisfaction? This is kind of off the subject of this creepy passage about rocks following them. 
to that idea of satisfying cravings. When you meet Christ, when he is all that you need, there's this deep sense of satisfaction. I, I never, I, there, I'm not thirsty anymore. So many people are just thirsting, hungering for something more, something else. And when you meet Christ and he satisfies your life, uh, you, you stop thirsting. I, I've experienced, maybe some of you have experienced exactly what the Bible tells us. When you drink of Christ, you'll never thirst again. So, he, all these common experiences that they've had, and then verse five, but. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So this whole group of Israelites, we don't know exactly how many came out of Egypt. Some estimate 2.6 million, 3 million. We know it was 600,000 men plus women and children. So the estimates vary, but we're looking at 2.6 to 3 million people that came out of Egypt, and all but two of them died in the wilderness. Their bodies were scattered all as they traveled, various situations, plagues, problems. That God, when they refused to go in by faith to the promised land, the judgment on that was that they would wander the, the wilderness until everyone from that generation died. It's the longest funeral march in history. Two, do you know who the two were that made it in? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, the only two, the two guys that had faith, the two guys that trusted God were the two guys that made it in. Interesting to think about what it means to be one in a million. I mean, these guys were a little bit more than that, but one in a million, if you toss a coin 20 times and every time it comes up tails, that's a one in a million chance. If uh, one of the babies born, one of the next 24 babies born in the U.S. becomes president, the chances of that are one in a million. So Joshua and Caleb, in, in, the, in the midst of this whole generation, all experienced these, this grace of God. Only two actually made it to the finish line. Do you see what Paul's doing here? Remember what we were talking about? Disqualification. And so of the 2.6 million people that came out of Egypt, only two crossed the finish line. That's pretty scary, isn't it? That's pretty sobering results. The rest of them, their bodies, has, I didn't write it, but that's pretty sobering. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Despite having received the grace of God, despite having tasted water from a rock and manna, and having been under the cloud and experiencing the, the salvation, the deliverance of God from the armies of Egypt and through the Red Sea, all that, so many of them did not, God says, the Bible says God was not well pleased with them. Well, doesn't that make you want to go, well, why not? I mean, I want to know why not. Paul, that's fine for them. But so what does that mean for us? What does it mean for the Corinthians? Verse 6, Paul says, now these things became our examples to the intent. Here's Paul, why Paul says that these things are there. This is why Paul's sharing this. To the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And he's going to go on through a whole fresh list of Old Testament stories so that we can see what are the problems that they had so we can do what, church? Say, avoid them. We can avoid them. That's the point. Moms and dads, have you ever pointed out to your kids another kid who is a bad example and said, don't be like that kid? Uh-huh. Don't be like them. They're getting in trouble, and I don't want you to get in trouble. My parents, I don't know if they're watching this via live stream or not. I don't know if they'll remember this story, but when I was a kid, I was a thumb sucker. Any other thumb suckers in here? All right, thumb suckers unite. Right, right on. Until at least I was about 16, then I finally quit. I couldn't drive with one hand on the, no. Uh, <laughs> but my parents had, had this, now my dad's an educator, PhD, but they had this uh, a figure, it's like a rubber, rubbery figure about this big, and it was this like zombie looking, ghoulish looking guy with like, you know, tattered clothing and a big cone head. And the, the, the striking fact was that he had great big buck teeth. I mean, this, this figure, zombie figure with tattered clothes, a cone head, and huge buck teeth. And a little rubber uh, suction cup on the back, and they put it up on the door in my room. And my parents said, if you keep sucking your thumb, you're going to look like that. And man, it worked. 
I don't, I don't know if my parents will remember that or not. But I remember it. I'm still in counseling over it. But the idea is that their warnings are very appropriate. And, and warnings come from a heart of love. Parents, don't you want to see your kids avoid the same mistakes you made? And that's all Paul is trying to say to us this new year. It's like, look, you got a whole year ahead of you. Uh, you know, who knows how much time? I mean, we, we never know how much time we have. But whatever time we have, I want you to make the best of it. And I want you to live fully for the Lord. And I want you to cross the finish line. I want you to finish the race. Parents, isn't that what we want for our kids? We want them to cross the finish line with the Lord. We don't want to just, pastors, we want for our congregations. I don't want you just to start well. I want you to finish well. And that's what Paul wants for his Corinthian church. I mean, this church is full of pride. They're, they're constantly against him. They're antagonistic. Uh, they're having so much trouble. And so he's got to hit them with a hard message. He's been, uh, the message of encouragement is great, but now it's time for a warning. So he says, the warning number one, don't lust after evil things as they lusted. Look where it got them. Desires are good. The desires are God-given. There are God, the, the emotion of desire is a God-given desire. There are certain things that are good to lust for, to crave after. Peter, in uh, 1 Peter, says to the church, you should desire the pure milk of God's word so that you can grow. He's going to tell the Corinthians, pursue love. You can desire spiritual gifts, and you should, but pursue love. So there's a place for desire. It's not just desire that Paul's talking about. He's talking about the desire for the forbidden, the lusting and the longing for the thing that is not allowed. And we know that that's the, the, the very thing that we're not allowed to have. That's oftentimes the very thing that we want, right? It's that wicked, prideful thing in me. Don't tell me what I can't have. That's what I want. Go right back to the Garden of Eden. Right back. There's only one tree that God says, don't eat that. They got how many other trees do they have? They got all kinds of fruit, all kinds of things to eat. And God says, there's one tree that I want you to leave it alone. And instead of focusing on the thousands of trees they could eat from, where, where, as soon as God said, don't eat that one, all their attention, boom, where's Eve? She's right by that tree. And it's just that, it's that, that human lustful desire. It's that, it's that longing, it's that dominating thought like an itch in my brain that needs to be scratched and thinking that if I satisfy it, then it will be better. But actually, when I scratch it, it gets stronger. What was it for the Israelites? They were remembering how good they had it in Egypt. Now all they had was this crummy manna, and they were getting tired of it. They'd already used every recipe in the manna recipe book. The test kitchen for manna had been exhausted. And they're just done with it. And so they complained to God. All we got this manna. We used to have fish and leeks and onions and all that good stuff. Now, they cried. They were miserable in their bondage in, in Egypt. But they don't remember that now. All they remember, you, you know, that's the funny thing about memory. You look back on your past life. But oh, how good it used to be. Oh, the party days of my life. Party days, how good they were. Are you kidding me? You spent most of your time with your head in a toilet. That is not fun. That's not good. But you don't remember that. They don't remember the beatings that they took. At that time, all they can remember, their brain is only focused on all the good things they seem to remember having had. So they cry out to God, we want meat. Now, this is why Paul brings it up. Because remember what the Corinthians were saying. They want meat sacrificed to idols. Doesn't, they don't, we don't care what it stumbles other people, what it does to other people. We want our meat. And we have the right to have our meat. Paul says, be careful. Be careful of your cravings for meat because they crave meat. Guess what? God allowed them to indulge. He brought them quail. Not for a, he said, I'm not going to bring them for a week, but for a whole month, I'm going to give them quail. And as they ate it, what happened to them? It came out their noses. Isn't that gross? How does meat, come, oh no, I don't want to go there. I don't even want to think about that. And, and a plague broke out as they were poisoned by this meat. And they buried, it doesn't tell us how many people, they buried a whole bunch of people there. You know what the name of that place was? In, in Hebrew, Kidroth Hata Ava, which means in English, the graves of craving. Now, how many people do you know today on the news, 
in your family that have been buried? How many dreams have been buried in the graves of craving? How many lives have been destroyed and are now buried in the graves of, all because I had a craving, a desire, a lust. I wanted something new. I wanted something different. I wanted something else. Those are roots of the, the craving monster. And craving is all about what I want, what I deserve. And that's what the Corinthians were saying. And that's why Paul brings this up. And he moves from that to idolatry. And do not become idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank and drink and rose up to play. Idolatry was an issue for the Corinthians. That's what they were saying. We want to eat meat. And where do we want to eat it? We want to eat it in the idol's temple. And so Paul brings up, well, let me remind you about another group of people that got hooked into idolatry, and it's in Exodus 32. You know the story, the golden calf story, right? You know the golden calf story? Moses goes up on the mountain, meet with God, 40 days. The people are going, man, we're tired of waiting. We don't even know if this guy Moses is coming back. Aaron, you got to do something. So Aaron says, okay, give me all your jewelry. They give him the jewelry. He melts it down and fashions a what? A golden calf. I mean, how big was this thing? We don't know. Fashions a golden calf. Moses comes down the mountain, sees them all. uh, Just this party is broken out. Uh, uh, Really an orgy, many would say, is what's going on. They're just playing, having a good old time, eating, drinking, and uh, doing their thing, doing whatever they wanted to do. And Moses is angry. He throws the commandments down. He says, Aaron, what is going on? Why are the people, this is what he asked. Now listen, pay attention. This is important. He says, why are the people unrestrained? Why haven't you restrained the people? I mean, look at them. They're just cut loose. They're doing whatever they want. They've gone crazy. And so Aaron said, I, you know, don't, don't look at me, Moses. You know, I just, I tossed the gold in the fire. You know the story, right? And bloop, out popped a golden calf. I mean, go figure, you know, who knew that would happen? It's a it's really a hysterical story. But what did they make? They made a golden, not a golden cow, but a golden calf. Uh, any farmers in here? That Anybody raise cows in here? No. I thought this is Fluvanna County. There's got to be some farmers in here. Okay, you've had cows. How easy is it to lead a calf? You have to halter break a calf. Because what is their natural instinct to do? They pull against. They pull away. They don't want to be restrained. They don't want to be led. That's why in that same chapter, Exodus 32, God says of this people, the Israelites, they are a stiff-necked people. They have made an idol that is just like them. And that's what we do. That's what idolatry does. Uh, We make idols, we make images of the things that we want. And so they were just like this calf. They were stiff-necked and unrestrained. A calf does not want to be restrained. So they worshiped the thing that they wanted. They made a God in their own image. Look, God is not up for grabs. The role of God is not one we decide by majority rule or we vote on or we even personally decide. For me, I've I've talked, have you talked to people about God? There's some crazy ideas out there. Well, what what do you think God is like? Oh, well, well, my God would do this, that. Okay, oh, well, my God would do this and my God, my God, here's the important thing. My God would never say no to me. That's what a lot of people's gods, they they want a God that will say yes to all the things they crave and desire, but will never say no to them. I have a father in heaven, and a good father knows how and when to say no to my cravings that are going to hurt me, and they're going to destroy. But see, human beings, in our pride, we don't like the word no, right? Are we together in this? I'm with you. You I'm preaching to to myself as I go through this. But this is the problem with idolatry. We 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 make an image, and then we worship it, and we become like it. We become what we worship. That's the the truth through the Bible. An idol says yes, but not no. The idol serves my needs and empowers me to live the life that I want to live. Well, this is great for them, uh, even for the Corinthians. You know, they're... They're toying with idolatry. But what about for us? You know, we we don't have statues and all that. William Barclay said, we do not now worship idols so blatantly, but if a man's God be that to which he gives all his time and thought and energy, men still worship the works of their own hands more than they worship God. So idolatry for us is very subtle in that we don't have a statue, but we have an idea, an ideology 
a value system, and that becomes what we worship at the cost of anything else. See, it starts as, well, I have the freedom to participate in this. I have the freedom to enjoy this, and you do. For them, it was, I have the freedom to go to this idol's temple and eat meat there. Well, you might, but pretty soon, now you're engaging in the activities that the idol worshipers are engaging in, and you're hanging out with the people that are there, and pretty soon, you're there more than you are at the temple of God. You see, the Corinthians wanted their cake and eat it too. They wanted to worship God with the, at the temple of God or at, with the people of God, and they wanted to worship idols. And God is saying, look, you can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't serve two masters. See, for us, God says, there sh- you shall have no other gods before me. And that's one of the hardest commandments. Because there are other things, the human heart, you know, the song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. What is it about us human creatures that is so prideful and so determined to make God in our image? In the beginning, God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them in his image. And then mankind has ever since returned the favor. We now create God in our image. For me, for you, it starts with a hobby or recreation, something we have the freedom to enjoy. And then it begins to demand more and more of me and more of my time and more of my money. And I'm buying this and I'm upgrading that. And now I have, my friends are all involved with that pursuit. And pretty soon, every time they gather, then I'm there with them at that gathering. I have no friends really in the church, in the body of Christ. All of my relationships, all of my fellowship is now around that hobby or that recreation, that thing that is meant to be enjoyed, but not to be worshiped, has become now the thing I worship, so much so that I'm no longer worshiping God. Do you know how it happens? You see that taking place. When that happens, you have been sucked in subtly to idolatry. God is no longer the passion of your heart. You know, it's amazing to me. Uh, People, Sunday comes and goes, the family of God gathering, Sunday comes and goes, well, you know, it's Sunday, I'm, I'm tired, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go without church today, or, you know, and I, I understand that, but man, somebody loses their cell phone, I mean, you will tear the place up to find your cell phone. I mean, I can't, the world has to stop. My cell phone is missing. I cannot live without my cell phone, but God, eh, I can do without him. I can do without the people of God, you know, I don't really need that. You see how it happens? Very subtle. The next lesson, verse 8, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Sexual immorality, a problem in Corinth, the idol uh, temple worship, the the temple prostitution that happened there, and Paul talks to them about sexual immorality even in their own midst. So this is an issue. Uh, I'm not going to get into the story just for the uh, sense of time, but Numbers 25 tells the story about how Balaam could not pronounce, remember Balaam and the talking donkey? How many of you know the talking donkey story? Okay, so you go back and read these things. It's Numbers 25, you can, or yeah, Numbers 22 through 25, you can read that. But God was determined to bless his people, and Balaam tried to curse them. The, The enemy had hired this prophet for hire to curse God's people, and every time the prophet opened his mouth, blessing would come out because God was determined to bless his people. So Balaam said to the, to the enemy, he said, look, I can't, I can't curse them, but here's what I can teach you to do. I can get you to seduce them into sexual immorality so that because you're then a just and a righteous God, then, then, then they'll have to be judged. So he gets them to bring a curse on themselves through sexual immorality. And the, the Moabite ladies get all decked out, gussied up, and they go over to the camp of the Israelites, and they say, hey, we're kind of neighbors, so hey, neighbor, why don't you come on over for dinner at our God's temple? I mean, it'll just be some snacks and some hors d'oeuvres, nothing fancy. And that one thing, they say, well, how bad, you know, we're neighbors, how bad could it be, right? I can handle it. And then pretty soon, they're involved in sexual morality. Pretty soon, it's extremely blatant. And the next thing they know, there's a plague that has started in People are dying because of it. We live in the the no consequence generation. I think this is the challenge. I I looked this up, uh, STDs way on the right, 2018, more STDs, sexually transmitted diseases than than ever before 
in America. And because uh, we live in a generation, I think I worry about the, gen, the young generation now. Do you guys worry about every generation that worries about the next generation? Uh, and I worry about them because um, I, I think when, when I was growing up, we still had a sense of consequence. And I think we understood that when you put a quarter in the video game, any video game junkies like me, I was a video game junkie. I spent a lot of time in the arcade. You had to take a bag of quarters, and when they were gone, they were gone. How many of you remember when you actually had a certain number of texts you could send? Right? When there was a limit? You remember that? There was a limit. And so you had to go, oh, you know, I got to parcel these out. I can't use all my minutes, can't use all my time, because I don't have unlimited. There were consequences to going over or running out. You're like, that was it, you know? Sorry. But now everything in the world of our kids is unlimited. There's no off button. There's no stop cue. We had the, the show started at, you know, 8 o'clock, and there was a commercial at 8.15, and it stopped at 8.30, and the show was over. But now it's binge watching round. They can just watch an entire seasons with no stopping. There's one of the, the things that psychologists are saying is our kids lack stop cues. They just keep going. And so when it comes to the area of sexual morality, we're seeing consequences of that. And, and people say, well, I can handle it. I, it's, just a, it's just a frat party. It's just a, a party at my neighbor's house. It's just a this. It's just a that. And, and it brings difficulty. Verse 9, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. So Paul says, heaping on, you know, don't tempt Christ. And this is a reference to both Exodus 17 Numbers chapter 21, what does it mean to tempt Christ? Hey, if Jesus really loves me, this is what he'll do for me. I mean, if God really loved me, he would do this. But God proved his love for you by giving the thing that mattered to him most, his son, to you on the cross to die for you. But if God's not doing what I want him to do, then I will manipulate God, or so I think, by saying, well, if God really loved us, he'd give us water. Well, if God really loved me, he'd give me that thing. Or how close can I get to the line? I mean, how few Sundays do I really have to be in church? You know, how little can I actually participate with the body of Christ and still be okay with God? And we tempt God. Remember Jesus tempted in the wilderness? How the, Satan tempts him, hey, throw yourself down. God will protect you from the consequences. And Jesus said, God would have. I mean, Jesus says, oh, you know, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I'm not going to tempt God by walking the line, expecting him to preserve me from the consequences of my actions. That's not the God that we know. God will allow you. David said it like this, until I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I pay attention. Sometimes God allows you to get off track to experience the consequences so you come running back to him and go, what a moron I am. I should have listened to you in the first place. You were so right. I was so proud. I'm such a loser. Will you take me back? And every time God says, you bet I'll take you back. What took you so long? I mean, think about my, what if my, what if my kids invited their friends over and said, my, my dad just loves me so much. He's so good to me. So good. He loves me so much. And I invite their friends over and they say, watch this. And just as, just as he's showing his friend outside, he takes his key, he takes a key, and he runs it down the side of my car. Now, if it was Helga's truck, you'd not notice. Those of you that know Helga's truck, you, you wouldn't notice that. But what if he takes his and pocket knife and pops my tires and says, see, my dad, I can do this and my dad will still love me. And guess what? He'd be right, wouldn't he? I'd still love him. I'd be pretty angry with him, but I'd still love him. But the question isn't, when we come to this temptation idea, the question isn't, well, does, is God still going to love me? If you're doing that, things that displease God, if you're purposely walking in disobedience, and the question isn't whether God will love you. The question is, do you really love God? If my son is willing to key my car and pop my tires, the question is, son, do you, do you not love your father? I mean, why would you do that to me? if you love me. You see what I'm saying? Nor complain, verse 10, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. None of us has ever done that, so we can move past that. Uh, complaining, again, an another, that's another place of pride. 
We are experts at knowing what everybody else should do with their lives. If you were president, it'd be a different world, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. That's what you, at least that's what you say on Facebook. Man, if you were the pastor, if you were the boss, it's prize. I know what to do. I know what I'm doing. And then we complain about what everybody else is doing because we have an elevated sense of our own self-importance and our own self-knowledge. And that was the Corinthians. All these things directly related. They were complaining about Moses and Aaron's leadership to God. Uh, I'll spare you the details. Ultimately, a plague breaks out. 14,700 people die in that Old Testament plague. They were complaining about Paul's leadership. And so Paul makes the connection. Now verse 11 says, all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition. Not for kicks and giggles. They were written so we could learn upon, for us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. I mean, time is drawing to a close. This age is coming to an end. And God says, look, these things were not recorded for them. They lived it. They didn't need to know what happened. They knew. So why bother writing these things in a book for us? This is a message in a bottle sent from a people from 4,000 years ago to a people that lived in 2018, coming into 2019, to say, hey, pay attention, heed the warning, get it straight. These things happen to them, and if you're not careful, what's going to happen? History will repeat itself, but it doesn't have to. Aren't you glad you can learn from other people's mistakes? Isn't that a good thing? So he gets down to the issue here. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And the, the conviction about pride, the conviction about the Corinthians, their overconfidence, number one, their overconfidence in their rituals. They would say, look, Paul, we're okay. I mean, we can handle this. Look, we, we're, we've been baptized. We par partake of communion. We're fine. They put an, over, um, an improper trust in the rituals of their religion for their safety. Isn't that interesting? Don't put, just because you were baptized doesn't mean you're okay. Just because you went through a ritual, just because you come forward and you, you take the cup, and remember they all had the spiritual drink, they all had the spiritual bread, but that doesn't mean you're okay if you go out and you live in, in sexual immorality or in complaining and all that stuff. Paul says, you know, be careful about that because it's the person who thinks he's standing in their pride that is in danger. The minute I say, hey, my marriage is okay, I'm fine, I'm not going to have any problems, then that's the minute I let my guard down. What Paul's saying is, don't let your guard down. Don't be so confident in your, in your place with God that you let your guard down and begin to indulge some of those desires that you have. Well, God will forgive me. God is gracious, isn't he? I mean, God loves me, doesn't he? He loves you. That's why he might let you enjoy some of those consequences from what you choose. God has never promised to keep you from the consequences. This reminds me of Samson. I mean, Samson's a classic Old Testament example. All these spiritual privileges, all of this calling in his life. He's a judge. He's got this power, this strength. And he takes it for granted, doesn't he? Every time you know, he gets bound, he says, oh, well, you know, my, I'll, I'll break out of it like I did before. No problem. I can deal with it. I can handle it. And then finally he tells Delilah that, hey, if they shave off my hair, then uh, I'll lose my strength. I'll be normal like everybody else. And uh, they shave off his hair, and he, and he wakes up, and he thinks he's going to be strong just like always before, and he doesn't know that the Lord has left him disqualified. Now, he makes it into the, to the hall of faith, but not, after having, not before having been blinded and bound and taken captive by the enemy. That's what's at risk here for Paul to the Corinthians. He doesn't want them to be disqualified because of their pride and their indulgence in sin. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. I like the way the Message Bible says it. First pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego the harder the fall. The minute you find yourself saying, I can handle it. it, well, it happened to them, but that'll never happen to me. We start playing with fire, and what happens? You get burned. We know it. It's over and over again. 
So Paul doesn't end there. He gives them one more verse. Uh, hang with me here. No temptation, he says to them. Now look, I've given you the warning, but now I'm going to tell you, no temptation has overtaken you, Corinthians, you in Fluvanna, except such as common to man. So there's nothing that the Corinthians were experiencing that was new. That's why he can go back 4,000 years or 2,000 years and grab those examples because the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the si Satan has one playbook. And once you figure it out, you do much better. So there's no temptation that is common to you. You are not unique. The things you crave, the things you desire, the things that, that your heart longs for, the, the illegitimate cravings, the sinful cravings and longings, uh, that's not, doesn't come about just because there's internet. Those cravings, the internet's just another way to pursue them. These things existed in the heart of mankind from the garden. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, beyond what you have uh, been given the power to endure. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear or endure it. That's a funny way. I mean, I want, with the temptation, we'll give you a way out so you don't have to deal with it. That's what I wanted to say. But he doesn't say that. He says, I'm going to give you a way out. That's God's perspective so that you can endure it. That's our perspective. Temptation, enticement to sin. It ha we can't avoid it. Like that ha temptation happens, right? Are we together in that? Uh, Martin Luther said, you, you know, the, you can't keep the bird from flying around your head, but you can keep him from making a nest in your hair. That temptation is not a choice, but sin is. And so when temptation happens for them, for us, for me, temptation happens because I have cravings and desires that I long to fulfill. Desire for pleasure, desire for self, desire for more, desire for new. And these things are real in our lives. I found, and what God says here is that he's going to give us a way out. There's an exit. There's an exit plan. And your job, my job, to take the exit. He's going to tell them, flee, run away, get out of there, cut it off, unplug it, whatever it has, find the, there's a way out. But the problem is the Corinthians, me and you, we're usually looking for the way in. We're usually trying to find a way to indulge. That's the problem because we really want it. I, look, I'm going to close with this. There's so much that can be said here. But uh, I've found that part of the benefits of walking with Christ I, I'm not going to tell you I don't, you know, wrestle with the same temptations you all do. I mean, Jesus in the wilderness, tempted. In all ways, tempted, just as we are. There's nothing that Jesus hasn't experienced that you and I haven't experienced. It's first temptation goes. Every time, every temptation, he, he meets it with the word of God. There was a desire to obey the Lord that was a stronger desire than the, the desire for the pleasure of fulfilling that, that craving. God gives us the desires of our hearts, doesn't he? There's th have you noticed as a Christian that there's things that you used to desire that all of a sudden you don't desire them anymore? I mean, I, when you're full, like, I ate so much Christmas dinner. Anybody else? I ate so much Christmas dinner that, that at the end of the night, Helga says, there, there's still some pie left. I was like, oh, ha, ha. No, you could not tempt me with pie. Why? because I was already so full. I was already full. If I am full of a desire to give, then greed does not tempt me. I mean, it tempts me, but, uh, but there's another desire that's stronger. If I am full of love, that there's a desire for self, but there's a desire for others that's stronger. And so God gives us the fruit of the Spirit he gives us love and joy and peace, and he satisfies so that when those temptations come, we're able to endure them. Yeah, that, you know, it'd be nice to have one of those, but I don't need it. I'm full. Christmas loses its whole materialistic pull on you when you already have everything you need. What, what, what can you crave when you already have everything you need? That's the real key. The only way you can be pulled into sin is when you have a, a chink in your armor, when there's a temptation 
when there's a sin, a secret craving that you have not dealt with or ministered to with the cross. So uh, thanks, Steve, for this New Year's message. Uh, like I said, I don't, don't shoot the messenger. But, you know, maybe this is ministering to you. Josh is going to end us with just a, uh, a closing chorus, and I'm going to stay late up here. I'll stay here. And maybe, you know, this, this New Year's is a time of repentance. Say, you know what, I need, to, I need to get that straight. I've been sitting on the fence. I've been living a double life. I've been living as a hypocrite. I'm engaged in this, I'm engaged in that. Nobody else knows it, but it's, I see God knows it. And it's keeping me from the best that God has for me. So, you know, as we stand, let's stand, church. If you want to talk, pray, think, uh, you can always come up down in front here, kneel at the stage. I'll be over here and be glad to, to pray with anyone uh, that has a need or desire to do so. Amen, church.